Hi, I'm Shaji Kumar from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In the recent uh, years, we have had several new therapies that have been introduced for treatment of multiple myeloma. And at times, it can be challenging to compare um, the different drugs in terms of how effective they are in treating multiple myeloma. In cancer, uh, in general, uh, we look at the, the amount of tumor that is eliminated uh, through the treatment as a primary outcome of efficacy for the particular um, uh, drug or therapy. Uh, of course, this has to also need uh, has to be taken in the context of the side effects that are associated with the drugs uh, when you look at the comparisons. But the primary uh, measurement um, for um, efficacy of an anti-myeloma drug has been based on the response rates. Now, the response uh, rates or the responses are defined um, using the International Myeloma Working Group consensus criteria, which relies on one or more measures of tumor burden, including the amount uh, of protein or the monoclonal protein in the blood or urine, um, the amount of plasma cells in the uh, bone marrow, and uh, findings of uh, myeloma uh, on the imaging studies, particularly uh, CT scans or PET-CT. The responses can be at various uh, levels, uh, depending upon uh, what proportion of the tumor has been uh, eliminated. And we have categorized them over the years as uh, minor responses, partial responses, very good partial response, complete response, stringent complete response. And more recently, we also added minimal residual disease negativity to the response criteria. Now, the responses are assessed um, primarily um, using the serum and the urine monoclonal protein levels. Um, and if neither, um, neither of these measurements are um, meeting the threshold that is needed for disease measurement, then we use the serum-free light chain levels. And if that isn't available, then we uh, use the bone marrow plasma cell percentage or uh, the size of uh, the tumor um, especially extramedullary disease that can be um, seen on imaging studies. Now, the important thing is uh, to remember that the response rate is only one of the aspects that we look at uh, when we are um, exploring or trying to understand the efficacy of a particular therapy. Another important dimension to this um, efficacy is the duration for which that response lasts. So you could get um, a very deep response that lasts for a very short period of time, or you could get a relatively lesser degree of response that lasts for a very long period of time. Um, and I think the, the duration for which we can control the disease is very important in the context of multiple myeloma, uh, especially given that none of the treatments that we use currently are uh, curative in nature. And what we have seen across um, multiple studies is that the deeper the response that you get, um, the longer the response generally tends to last. Um, and what we, what we can see from multiple studies is that if you get a complete response versus a partial response, you have a better progression-free survival, meaning the, the, the time it takes for the myeloma to come back up is longer with a deeper response. But ultimately, we, the, the goal is to improve the overall survival of the patients. And what we also have seen is that as we get deeper and deeper responses, uh, the improved progression-free survival also translates to improved overall survival in general. And this is particularly true when we look at some of the uh, more recent studies that have looked at minimal residual disease negative status. And this, again, refers to someone who uh, we cannot detect the monoclonal protein in the blood or urine and a bone marrow doesn't show any plasma cells using the tests that we have, at least to the level of uh, one in 100,000. And of course, the imaging studies don't show any evidence of disease either. Now, in patients who get to be MRD negative, compared to those patients who remain MRD positive, there is an improved progression-free survival, and there is also an improved overall survival in the majority of those studies. Now, it's important to remember that the, and a deeper response may not always translate to improved uh, progression-free survival or improved overall survival because there are other biological factors that also play an important role uh, in driving these uh, survival uh, outcomes. 
And um, especially uh, when you compare what we see in the clinical trials versus what we see in the real world, there can be a, def a definite gap between what we often talk about as a efficacy versus effectiveness gap. Uh, and that is driven by the fact that the patients whom we put on clinical trials are not truly representative of the general population because um, of the stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria that's often included for clinical trials. As a result, a very selected group of patients often get enrolled in clinical trials. Now, keeping aside that uh, issue of the generalizability of test results or generalizability of the clinical trial results, um, it is also important to understand what else goes into that equation of the relationship between depth of response uh, or response rate um, and um, the real world outcomes of survival. So in, in we know that myeloma is a very heterogeneous disease often driven by the differences in the genetic abnormalities in the my, uh, myeloma cells. We know that patients with high risk disease um, for a given degree of response, a patient with a high risk disease uh, will um, relapse sooner than a patient with standard risk disease. Again, reflecting the biology of the underlying uh, myeloma cell. Um, again, denoting a higher rate of division, cell division, and proliferation. So that, so that is an important aspect uh, when you think about uh, the relationship between the depth of response and um, eventual survival outcome. The second important thing is the toxicity related to the therapy. So if you have a drug that is quite effective but also quite toxic, uh, it's possible that some of the patients might um, uh, die from complications of the treatment itself, which can actually shorten the survival rather than improve it, or even neutralize some of the impact that we might have gotten from the drug that is effective. Now, the third situation is that you have toxicity that doesn't necessarily um, is in life-threatening, but it actually ends up uh, delaying therapy or um, the treatment cannot be given delivered in time because of persistent toxicity. And in that situation too, we end up with the same uh, we can end up with the same scenario where you have, again, deeper responses, higher response rates, but does not translate to a better progression-free survival or overall survival. So um, it's always important when we compare the um, uh, response rates that we see from the clinical trials, um, how it translates into the real world um, depends a whole lot on the types of patients we treat, um, and also the um, in terms of the disease um, risk, but also in terms of um, um, the tolerability of the drug. Uh, 